Let me tell you about you, whether you're a follower of Christ or not. Same holds true for me. There is a reason why you are alive. There is a purpose for you on this planet while you're here in the season of history that you absolutely live in. And that's part of your identity. I, I'm called to do something. Let me tell you what I know about you, what I know about me. That when we sit there, we think sometimes. And, and we'd like to really know that, uh, am, I, I'm, am I making a dent in society? Am I making a dent somewhere for good? Am I helping people out? Because I think we think those things when we're alone and honest with ourselves. Because down deep inside every human, we want to know, why am I here and what am I supposed to do? You see, that's the call of God upon a life. And it's wrapped up in the reality of God has put gifts and abilities in you and in me. There are things that if you put your heart into, your gifting, and then you get better at it, you become outstanding at those things. But you've got to find what that is based on your gift. And then wrapped around that is your passion. Every one of you is passionate about a few things in life. And you've got to find out what your passion is within the kingdom of God. And it usually involves maybe some past pain in your life that you see the pain in others you want to help out or something that God has grown you up in and brought you out of. Now you want to help people come out of that. You're, there's something that, that's your passion. It can also be different people groups within your passion. But every one of us has some things like that. And within our identity, it's called our calling. And we've got to find it. If we're truly going to live life, well, the way we were meant to live life. So hold that thought. Let's go to the key verse of the series. This is the verse I'm going to ask you to read all together. I'm going to count to three. Then we will read. Here we go. One, two, three. For we are, his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Now, we've said, first, last week we said it, we'll say it every week, workmanship. The idea of that word, we get our word poem. That God, if we allow ourselves and we submit ourselves to what the Bible says, then God is going to write our life. It's a poem. How many of you would be honest enough to admit that you and I have taken our life into our own hands and we've written some lines in the past for our own life that didn't turn out too good in the poem? Anybody know what I'm talking about? That's right. But as we now allow ourselves, uh, submit ourselves to what God says, we allow God to write the poem of our life. So our tagline is, you were, but you are. Now let's say it all together. You were but you are. Now, what we're saying with that is that you and I were this, but when we came to Christ, became a fall of Christ, now we are this as we submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So this morning, open up your Bible to Ephesians 1 or your app. I'm going to read verses 13 through 16, and then we're going to go into four points this morning about calling. But let me do a little commentary on verse 13 to 16 of chapter 1 of Ephesians. It says this, In Him, meaning God, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise. The moment you place faith in Jesus, you are sealed in the Holy Spirit. I like the word sealed because it means to mark something. It's the idea of a signet. They'd have a stamp or a signet ring where, say there's a letter they wrote, they scroll it up, then they melt wax and they seal it, but they put their stamp, their signet on there. It's a stamp of the person mailing that scroll that the authority of that person's carrying. You don't mess with that seal. That's the authority. It makes it authentic. Now, when you came to Christ and put your faith in Him, you became an authentic follower marked by Jesus Christ as a follower of God by the Holy Spirit. Now, about five years ago, I was in New Jersey in this little town called Ocean City. And in Ocean City, um, I like that town a lot. I've been there, went there again last year. But one night, me and a few couples that went out there on vacation, we decided that we wanted some authentic Mexican food. Did I tell you I was in New Jersey? 
Okay, good. You're, you're catching on now. And so, not Taco Bell. I was, that would have been better, but... Uh, but so we looked at different place that authentic Mexican food, so we go there. And there was a little bit of a line, so I thought, that's a, that's a good sign, right? And as I'm in line, um, I saw it. I, I looked through the kitchen, I, could, I saw it. And I didn't tell my wife, because I just didn't want to go to another place, and we were already in line, and, but I knew if I told her what I saw, we were never going to eat there. At least I didn't think we would. But I saw it back in the kitchen, and on the shelf back there, they had, at this authentic Mexican food place, they had those prefabricated taco shells you buy at the supermarket. You already feel it, don't you? You feel my pain. But I thought, okay, we're here, you know, you know, so get our food, sit down. Other people seem to be enjoying everything and, you know, license plates from New Jersey or New Hampshire and this and that. But uh, so, and we ate, our, we tasted our food. It was like, oh my gosh, this is not authentic Mexican food. But how many know when you pay for it, you're going to eat it, right? So you're going to eat it. That's it. It wasn't authentic at all. Let me tell you, the moment you became a Christian, you weren't a prefab taco shell on a shelf anymore, okay? You became the real deal. You're an authentic believer sealed by the Holy Spirit with the signet. Verse, verse, amen out there, huh? Verse 14, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession. To the praise of his glory. So the word pledge there is the idea of an engagement ring that once you come to Christ, you're engaged to Christ. And the final uh, coming together is at the wedding supper of the Lamb in Revelation 19. It's going to be a great day for believers. Verse 15. For this reason I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayer. So he says, I'm praying for everybody. So here we go. Four points. I hope you're taking notes. Point one is this one. To live my true calling, I have to know God. I have to know God. Now look at verse 17 and let me read it to you. It says this. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge. Say knowledge. Try it again, say knowledge. In the knowledge of Him. Now, key word right there. How does anyone get to know God? Well, you get to know God the way you get to know anyone else, and I'll share that in a second. But when he uses the word knowledge, it's the Greek word epigonosko. Uh, you don't even know that, but gnosko is the idea of a husband and wife, what they do to make a baby. I don't have to explain that, right? Okay. No, God bless you over there. No, okay, because I have visuals. No, I'm just joking. Um, it's what you do to make a baby. That's the word Paul uses to tell you that's how you need to know God. That's how you got to get to know God. So how do you get to know anyone? It's God too? Well, the same way you get to know a friend. You meet someone, you don't know them, start hanging out with them, get along with them, start sharing, you know, maybe go to movies, maybe go to a venue, go out to eat, do more of that stuff. Pretty soon you trust, you share things, you start sharing more and more and more and more till pretty soon that you share things that you share with no one else and you really get to know that person and that person gets to know you. That's how it works. Same thing with God. I told you about four weeks ago, just spend 10 minutes a day with God. The first four minutes, just read some New Testament. Read the Gospels. The next three minutes of the ten minutes, do you remember what I said? Sit still before God. Don't say a word. Let God land thoughts upon your mind after you've read. Then the next one minute after those three minutes, then you begin to thank God verbally for all the good things in your life because how many know there's a lot of good things in your life? And you've got to do that because pretty soon you're going to get pretty cynical and negative about life and about family and everybody else. And then the last two minutes, then you just petition. You say, God, I pray for so-and-so. Lord, would you uh, fix this situation? God, can you do this? And then you're done. Just do 10 minutes a day, and you'll begin to know God, and know God, and know God, and you'll develop that intimacy, that ganasco with God. That's the first thing to do to find your calling, because you'll never know what your true calling and purpose is unless God shows you, because God created you and I. Number two in your notes, then he says this, to, to find my call and purpose, I have to heal my heart. Very important uh, verse right here, verse 18, he says this, I pray that the eyes of your heart 
may be enlightened. I'm going to stop right there because I'm going to use that verse three times in the next points. Now, he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. He's saying, and he says, I pray. In other words, you better get this one. Better pay close attention to what he's saying right now because here's what he's saying. How many of you understand by now in life that you do not view or see life through your eyes, you see it through your heart? Oh, your eyes are the thing that picks up the visuals and brings it into your body, but you interpret all of life through your heart, do you not? Your, your pains, your wounds, the good times, the bad times, the relationships, good ones, the broken ones, all, you, you interpret it through, all, through the heart. And so he's saying, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. In other words, I've got to fix my heart and I've got to heal my heart the way Jesus says my heart should be healed. Now, what, what's one way to do that or maybe the way to do that? And that's this. You've got to forgive. You've got to let go. You've got to quit holding on to bitterness. You've got to quit... Uh, you know, say, well, they this and they that and they this and they that. You know, all of us, how many of you have a they this and they, they that story? Anybody besides me? Everybody has that. But you've got to be able, you've got to forgive because, you see, the more free in here, the better I see out there. Any amens? The more free in here, the better I see out there. So I've got to learn to forgive these things. And look, he's saying, first, you've got to know God. And once you start knowing God, then you've got to start forgiving and healing up your heart. Now, why is this important? Let me tell you why. Because in that verse, he makes a statement of two words. He says, so that. Now, what he's saying is this. You cannot move to the so that, to one and three, until you are practicing for a period of time, point one and point two. You've got to practice knowing God consistently, and you've got to start healing your heart, or else you'll never get to the so that. You'll never get to the third point, and that's the most important one, I think. And that is number three, and that's this. I have to discover my purpose. I have to discover my purpose in life. Verse 18, let's go back to it. And to get to the middle of it now, it says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. Now stop right there. So now he says, so that you will know the hope of his calling. So I've got to know God I've got to start healing my heart, forgiving, letting go, so I can know what my calling is. The problem with unforgiveness and bitterness and everything that goes along with those things is it fogs us all up on the inside. Amen? I told you this story, and I'll tell it to you again. Five years ago, I was in Kentucky in June. Has anyone ever been in Kentucky in June? Don't go in June, okay? But I was in the car... And we were in Bowling Green, and what I say, it's, it gets humid and hot there. And I, 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 last year, I went to other places that were really worse than that. I was in um, Savannah, Georgia. Boy, that was humid. Anybody, anybody been there before? And then Charleston, South Carolina, loved the place, but the, oh my gosh, the humidity was bad. I wanted to get back in the car immediately. That's how bad it was. It was oppressive. It was almost demonic, I think. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> But I'm in Kentucky about so many years ago. We're going to go to the Corvette Museum. And it's hot and humid. I'll never forget the moment. I open up my side door to get out. And as soon as I open the door, my glasses boom, fogged right up. In like one half second. And I couldn't see anymore because I'm so fogged up. I think that's what happens when we hold on to unforgiveness and bitterness. We get fogged up. I was 18 years old. It was like 1999. And I remember this moment like it was yesterday. <laughs> It was 1974, and it was my first year. I was going to college, a Chafee College, and I was driving out there because there was no Norco campus for RCC. So we had to drive places back then, believe it or not. And, uh, you know, we started the car by kicking our feet on the, you know, stuff like that. So I'm driving out there, and it was really foggy morning. And I'm driving slow because you can't see hardly, you know, 20 feet in front of you. And everybody's flying by me. And I thought, how are these people going to have accidents? How are they doing? Why are they going so fast? I can't see. And finally, I did what you do on days like that. I took my finger, and I made the angle like that, made a flat surface, and I went to my windshield on the inside, and I went like that. And in that moment, I realized I'm an idiot because the inside of my car was what was fogged up, not the outside. 
And so because the inside was fogged up, not the outside, everybody on the outside was passing me up and I'm driving slow as molasses because on the inside I'm fogged up. Let me tell you about life. And this is very important. Unforgiveness, bitterness, it will fog you so up on the inside. It will slow your life down. Others will be passing you by. You wonder why? It's because you're all stuck on the inside and you'll never find your purpose in life. Now, he connects hope with calling and things important. Let me give a statement here of what I thought was an important statement. I found this quote. Here we go. It says this. He who has a why to live for can bear almost any how. Would you agree? If I know why I'm alive on planet Earth, no matter what how comes at me, I, I can plow right through and I can stay going with it because I know why I'm here. Any amens? Yeah. Now, let me share one of my favorite verses and I know all verses are my favorite. I get it, okay? But this one is a cool one in Acts chapter 13. Put on the screen. Luke the writer is writing down a message being preached by one of the first followers and he, the, the preacher is quoting something about David, King David from the Old Testament and, and he says this. Watch, this is a great verse. For David, after he served the purpose of God in his own, say the word generation, his own generation, fell asleep, meaning he died, and was laid among his fathers and underwent decay, meaning once you die, you start to decay. But notice that David lived his life with purpose in the season of history in which he was put. He understood what he was there for, and he ministered and lived within a generation and did and lived out what his calling was. Follow me so far? The season he was born in, that's what he, he lived it right there. Now, I went to Starbucks like a week and a half ago. And um, they gave me this, I didn't even ask for it, but it must have been, uh, I don't know, first hundred people or whatever. So I order what all senior pastors order, white chocolate mocha hot with whipped cream on top of it like that. <laughs> and I got that and uh, they hand me a cup a free cup. And it's, it's a Christmas cup, but it said, Merry Coffee. <laughs> Anybody get one of those? Yeah, and people want those, huh? But it said, I'm going to auction mine off afterwards, after the service. <laughs> it said, Merry Coffee. I thought, Merry Coffee? Now, I'm going to get in the flesh right now for a minute, okay? I'm just telling you right now. This is not in the spirit. I'm gonna, this is Jim in the flesh now, okay? Because some things really bother me. And, uh, and by the way, I'm not saying let's go uh, boycott Starbucks, because if I start doing that, I'll have to boycott every store, I'd have to boycott you, I'd have to boycott me, I'd have to boycott everything, right? Because it's all over the place. But here's what, it bothers me that, that there's maybe a million people in America that will bring a lawsuit against corporations and companies if they put Christmas or Jesus on anything and they ruin it for the other 374 million of us. Any amen? amen? I want Christmas back, okay? I want Merry Christmas back. Is that too much to ask? No, I'd like that right there. So give me it back, okay? And I, and I don't blame the companies because lawsuits will come. It's terrible. But here's the hypocrisy. I'm still in the flesh, by the way. I'm going to be in the flesh and I'm going to jump to the spirit real quick, but you've got to see when it happens. The marketers right now, they are pumping commercials at you and I like nobody's business to get us to buy, huh? Yes. To buy gifts for others, huh? Yes. That's the season that we're in right now, the, this December season. It's season's greetings now, right? But they will not put in those commercials the reason for the season. So they have no reason except to say, could you go out and buy gifts for everyone? But they don't give us the reason anymore, correct? I think that's rather hypocritical, personally. Now, I'm going to jump. Watch me jump to the Spirit. I'm in the Spirit right now. <laughs> but we Christians have the same problem. Because we are born and we live in a certain season of time right now that you're alive, but we have forgotten the reason why we are alive. We have never even found out possibly why we are here. What's the reason I am on planet Earth at this season? 
What are my gifts? What is the call upon my life? What does God want me to do? How am I supposed to make a dent in the pain of this world for the gospel of Jesus Christ? Any amen? Amen. See, we can live in the season of life, but not even ever know the reason why why we are here. Now, at least to number four. Number four is this. I have to take my eyes off the past. I have to take my eyes off the past. Look at verse 18 again. At the very end, but I'll read the whole thing. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. So we got this big inheritance. God is rich, got a big inheritance, but it's in the saints. When he says in the saints, let me tell you quickly what he means. He means that you will never walk in the fullness of Jesus Christ and all he has for you if you isolate yourself and mail in your Christianity to a local fellowship. You cannot live it by yourself. You must be involved in the body of believers. Therefore, when you do that, you are in the fullness of the riches of the inheritance of Jesus Christ. Any amen on that one right there? Now let's get to inheritance. Inheritance really has to do with the future. Some of you are thinking, one day when my parents kick over, man, I'm getting a pretty good chunk of stuff. You could laugh at that. It's okay, because they're, they're going no matter what, okay? It's just true. But your inheritance is in the future. Let me tell you what God, one of the things God is saying. I'm going to give you two things God is saying here. The future. Do you, do you understand that when it comes to your life, that God deals with you on the basis of the future and not your past? No, do you understand that? That God deals with you and I on the basis of the future and not your past or my past. So whatever you've ripped up, torn up, messed up, blown up in your life, God says that's the past now. It's under the blood of Jesus. And I want to work with you on the basis of where I want to take you and your future. Anybody like that? Now, here's our problem, why we don't get this. This is one of the reasons why we don't get it. Because the way we typically operate as humans on this planet is this. We look at every, we look at a lot of people according to, oh, they did this, and six months ago that, and two years ago they did that, and they did this to me. How many know what I'm talking about? See, we are looking at people and viewing them on the basis of what they've done in their past. We're not looking at what God wants to do in their future. And when you do that and view people according to the past, whatever you sow, you reap. It comes right back at you. And so the way you view people according to the past, you will do the same to yourself. It's inevitable. It's inevitable. So we're actually, by judging people according to the past or viewing them that way, we're hurting our own future because we're staying stuck and being fogged up on the inside even more so. Does that make sense? Okay, here's the last thing I'm going to tell you. When Paul says the riches of God's inheritance, what's inheritance like future stuff? He's saying be open to what God has already given you. What's my favorite story in the Bible? Prodigal son. God bless you for knowing that. I, I was thinking about this and God gave me a little new insight for the, and I've, I've been studying that story off regularly for decades. But let me give you what God told me in the story this time. It correlates to Ephesians 1. The idea is be open to what God has already given you. Now listen, please listen. Because somebody here needs to hear what I'm going to tell you. The prodigal son leaves. He takes the inheritance that dad gives him. Which means, dad, you're dead to me. He blows it all. He rips it up, tears it up, blows it up. Loses everything. He's lying there and he comes to his senses and he realizes, I'm a stupid idiot. Have, have you, besides myself, anybody here besides one day realized in life, I'm an idiot? Raise your hand how many ex-idiots are here. Praise the Lord. Um, And he decides, I'm going home to my dad. And he starts going home and he practices the the repentant speech. Father, I've sinned against heaven in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me a hired slave. He gets there and he says, Father, I repent, I've sinned. And dad never lets him say, make me a servant or a slave. And then dad does the amazing thing because the boy stinks. He was working with pigs. He's all dirty, he stinks. And before the townspeople family can get there, he puts his own robe on the boy. It's from, from neck 
to ankle to the feet. So you can't see the dirt and slime and all the muck. You can't see anything anymore. In other words, he looks like good, all right? He's styling now. And then dad says, you know, put the ring on his finger. That's a signet. Remember signet? Stamp? Authenticity? That's my boy. He gets to go out in the field right away, man. Not waiting to eight years to be reinstated. Then he put shoes on him. And I'm sure they were Nikes. Amen to that one. <laughs> and then he slays the fattened calf. We're going to have a big party. And they're having a great time. But how many know there's another brother? Right? How, how many don't know there's another brother? Just Okay, don't raise your hand. Okay. <laughs> and the other brother's out there, but he won't. He hears there's this joyful music in the house. And he goes, what's going on in there? Oh, you know, your brothers come home and your dad say the fattened calf. They're having a great time. Man, it makes that brother so mad. What? And he won't come in the house. Not going in there at all. Because he heard dad is slaying the fattened calf for the brother. And no, I'm not. dad has to go out to him. Son, come on, please. Now think about it. Now let me put it together. That other brother will not come in the house where the father is. Therefore, he is not getting to know the father. Any amens? What was point one? To find your calling, you've got to know God. You've got to start knowing God. He will not come in and know the father. The father comes out there and he starts, son, come on, please come in. And the boy, in anger, in anger, he starts saying all the things that you know, my brother did this and my brother did this, all the past stuff. He even makes things up if you know the story. And if you think about that, what's wrong with this brother? He, he, the, the eyes of his heart are, are broken, are they not? There's so much wound, so much pain, so much anger, so much unforgiveness, so much that, that he cannot see life straight because the father says this, son, all that I have has always been yours. But all the boy says, you didn't slay a calf for me. But he says, all I have is, is yours, always been yours. Why is it? You ever notice that, you know, some of you in here, hear what I'm going to tell you. What's, what's going on in the story is the dad has given the same thing to all the kids, but that day the boy gets a fattened calf and all of a sudden you sit there and you go, you do more for him than for me. Anybody? Anybody sitting in that one right there? And you no longer are thankful for all your parents have done. Isn't that wild? That you can focus on one thing that your sister or brother got and now it's on. <laughs> How pitiful that is. Right? Let it go, man. Let it go. But he says, all that I have has always been yours. Here's what he's saying. When I die, everything that I have, it was already yours before I die. It's always been yours. It's always been your inheritance but you're so foggy on the inside, you can't see it. You're so foggy on the inside with anger and bitterness and hate that you can't see it. Let it go, son. Let it go. There's no end to the story. We don't know how it ends. We just know that he stays angry. And he never walks in the fullness. But it was always there for him. Let me, let me finish off with, how many like my, my, my corny, stupid illustrations? I got one. Okay, good. Thank you, April. Okay, here's how it works. Dorothy wants to get back home to Kansas, right? <laughs> Am I right? Yes. Okay. And at the end of the movie there, remember the wizard? They've got the hot air balloon. Remember that? Yeah. He's going to take her back to Kansas. And, uh, you know, he's a wizard, but he's kind of inept, Right? Somehow he loosens the ropes and he, he takes off and leaves Dorothy. You know, when I was like five, I thought, oh no. But the second time I knew what was coming. So he takes off and Dorothy, she's, you know, she's crying. I'm not going to get home to see any M, any M, you know. And all of a sudden here comes the good witch. Remember her? You remember, right? It's funny, huh? a good witch. And she says to Dorothy, you know, Dorothy, what, what is it? She goes, hey, you know, I, want, I want to go home. She goes, oh, Dorothy, you know, the way she talks. 
She says, you've always had the power to go home. What? Yeah. You know those ruby red slippers you're wearing that are very uncomfortable? <laughs> All you had to do was tap them together three times and then say, oh, 20 of you have seen it. There's no place like home. And she tapped her heels together three times. She says, there's no place like home. And home she goes. I want you to think about that. She always had the power. She always had it all there. She just didn't know. She didn't understand what she had. As a follower of Christ, you have this full inheritance in God. And a big piece of it is who you are and your identity and your calling to make a big dent in this world to help people. But you'll never know it. You'll always wonder what it is. You'll never know you have it unless you get to know God who created you and made you the way you are and then heal your heart and let go of the past. And once you start to do that, man, those ruby red slippers, they come in real handy. Amen. Let's pray. Hello, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the message. And I would just like to invite you to share that with as many people or one person that you think just might need that. Because not only do we want the Bible to be truthful, which it is, we want it to be useful. And we try to make it as practical as possible for me, for you, and for any friends that we have, especially those far from Jesus that might need that. And another thing too you can do is you can now subscribe to the New Beginnings YouTube channel so that when these messages are archived, it'll pop up and let you know it's there. And you can go back and watch that or once again, share it with somebody else. So we just hope you have a blessed day. Once again, hope this thing ministered to you and look forward to seeing you again soon.